At the end of the last part of this lecture, I asked you to find the energy needed to raise 100 grams of copper by a temperature change of 5 Kelvin. And you will have had to do a quick calculation to do this. And as I say, it's largely a unit analysis issue. You can, of course, use the definitions of these various quantities to derive an equation. But I'm going to show you how to do it entirely from unit analysis. We want a change in thermal energy, and so that is going to be in joules. Well, how can we combine the quantities that we have to get joules? Let's take these molar quantities. So we have a molar specific heat capacity in joules per mole Kelvin. And if we want to get joules, we're going to have to multiply it by a temperature in kelvins. That's our delta T. And we're going to have to multiply it by a number of moles. Now, we don't know how many moles of copper we have, but hopefully you see that we can just get that from the molar mass. So I'm going to replace these moles with the way we would have to do that which would be by taking grams, our mass of copper, and dividing by grams per mole, our molar mass of copper. And so what we're seeing is that our change in thermal energy should just be this. And if you plug in the numbers, you're going to get something around 190 joules. And of course, you can do exactly the same thing with these volumetric quantities. And again, when you plug in the numbers, you're going to get around 190 joules. One of the main themes throughout this course is going to be how we, and by we I mean humanity, convert various forms of source energy into other forms of energy that we can use. So let's get a bit of a better sense for the nature of some types of source energy. And let's start with chemical energy. Let's be concrete and talk about a specific chemical reaction, say the combustion of propane. And often in this chemical equation, on the product side, we might write plus energy, but be careful about that because, of course, we don't believe that any energy has been created here since energy can't be created. The point here is that that energy was in the propane and the oxygen on the reactant side of the equation, and now it has been, in some sense, liberated into some other form of energy. What form depends on the nature of the process? So if we look at simple combustion, just burning of propane, then most of that is going to be thermal energy after the reaction. You might be wondering why I say that after the reaction, this energy is mostly and not entirely thermal energy. And this gets us into some ideas that are going to come back over and over. So let's have a look. Let's suppose we have a fuel oxygen mix in a cylinder with a piston, and now we burn it. As it burns, it expands, and to do so, it has to exert a force on the piston. So in the end, it, it's hot, so it has gained thermal energy, but it has also expanded and is now occupying more space. As it pushed on the piston, it did positive work on the piston, but that tells us that the piston did negative work on the expanding gases. And so the energy bar chart must look like this. And so that initial chemical energy will have been converted mostly to thermal energy, but also to work that was done on the environment. Now let's look at the nature of that chemical energy. What is it really? In the same sense that we say that thermal energy is kinetic energy at the molecular scale. So despite how I drew the energy bar chart, the system didn't lose all of its chemical energy. The reactants simply had more chemical energy than the products. Let's think about an oxygen molecule because it's the simplest molecule here. At any given instant, those two oxygen atoms could be, say, moving away from each other, and the molecule has a bunch of internal kinetic energy. Later on, they'll be at their maximum distance from each other. Later on still, they'll be coming towards each other, and we'll have some internal kinetic energy again. And eventually, they'll be squashed together as close as they get. 
Well, so that internal kinetic energy can't just disappear, it must be coming from somewhere. The interaction between the oxygen atoms is an electrical interaction between its electrons and the positively charged nuclei. So this is electric potential energy we're talking about here. This is really just like taking two carts connected with a spring and stretching them out and releasing them, and we're going to get an oscillation where kinetic energy is being exchanged with spring energy. Only here it isn't a spring energy, it's an electric potential energy. What we're seeing here is that in the same sense that thermal energy is kinetic energy at the molecular scale, chemical energy is a combination of electric potential energy and kinetic energy at the molecular scale. And this explains why when I drew this original categorization of types of energy, I put the source energy where I did in the diagram, in between energy of motion and energy of configuration, because it's a combination of microscopic incoherent kinetic energies and microscopic incoherent potential energies. The arguments for what other source energies really are are broadly similar to what I just did for chemical energy, so I'll go through them rather quickly. Nuclear energy is a lot like chemical energy, but instead of talking about interactions between atoms, which are electrical interactions, we're talking about the interactions between protons and neutrons in the nuclei. So those interactions are partly electrical because the protons are all positive, but what holds the nucleus together is the strong nuclear force. And so nuclear energy is a combination of strong nuclear potential energy, electric potential energy, and kinetic energy. Light energy is a little different. A traveling light wave is a combination of electric fields and magnetic fields. Perhaps we'll look at this in a little more detail later, but for now I will just say that light energy is a combination of incoherent magnetic and electric potential energy at the microscopic scale. 